I can't believe we're here already. We are at the final format of the Yu-Gi-Oh! GX era. It feels like it was yesterday when we started with Cybernetic Revolution, talking about Cyber Dragon, Exerion Universe, and of course, Mad Lobster. GX wasn't all fun and elemental heroes. There was not one, not three, but two emergency ban lists for the power creep was powerful enough to turn the meta into an OTK wasteland. First was late 2006 with Cyber Stein, and second was May 2008 with Allure of Darkness and the two Mass Banish Zone Return cards. The latter we just covered in Dad Return format, which leads us to right now in the Yu-Gi-Oh! timeline. In the previous format, we saw decks appear here and there like Zombie, Gadget, and Six Samurai. However, what also appeared was two similar OTK decks and the plethora of topping Dad Return decks, which also had OTK potential thanks to the new top tier boss monster, Dark Armed Dragon. If you couldn't afford the expensive deck featuring Dad, Crush Card Virus, and Allure of Darkness, then you were forced to play something else. This created a meta defined by deep wallets and an ever-evolving OTK-focused framework. This, of course, is not healthy for the game and an emergency list had to happen to hopefully rectify the toxic issues, and not in a Britney Spears like way. Well, maybe in a pretty Spears like way, but not like the song Toxic, because that song is a uh, certified banger. Moving from this, the next format would be created in May and be formed throughout the summer 2008 period, ending in July. Said format would wind up being known as Gladiator Format for the clearly dominant top deck, Gladiator Beast, a deck I'll cover later on. So before we get into the meta, let's discuss what sets were added to the Royal Magic library. After all, what is a format if not the sum of its cardboard roots? Releasing on March 12th, we have the Champion Pack Game 6. Nothing of meta relevant came from this set, however, what would be important would be a much needed Elemental Hero Stratos reprint, considering he was a Shonen Jump promo beforehand. Also, we got a 2001 OCG card in Rigorous Reaver. I can't help but think what this card would have done to early fire decks. Uh, though saying early fire decks is probably saying enough to know nothing could help them since Fire Kraken and Mr. Volcano are about as effective as electric Pokemon are to ground types. But hey, if UFO Turtle could find meta relevancy five years after release, who am I to say Fire Kraken won't get his due? One day later would be the real big set, the only core set of the format, Light of Destruction. The set introduced the Light Sworn archetype, the Arcana Force archetype, is that a JoJo's reference? And Frog Support. Out of these, Light Swarms would be the only one relevant upon release. It would be the counter to Dark counterparts in name only, as these cards were solely original in both name and effects. Much like the milling effect of Card Trooper, Light Swarms were all about not only milling, but gaining effects depending on if the card was milled or not. For for example, if Wolf Lightsworn Beast is sent from the deck to the graveyard, you can special summon him, and Lila Lightsworn Sorceress must mill three cards from your deck during your end phase. Similarly to Gadgets, this new archetype wouldn't see immediate tops since its true engine wasn't released yet. However, Duelists still did the best of their ability to adapt it to the meta scene. Other noteworthy cards of Light of Destruction would be anti-meta cards like Fossil Diana Pachycephalo, Deck Lockdown, and Summon Limit, as well as Judgment Dragon, Honest, and Gladiator Beast Geysaris. Some cards that garner interest for me include Wetlands, a field spell for weak aqua monsters, Ducker, Mobile Cannon as an old-school recursion flip monster, and Level Tuning, which had to be a sign of things to come. But going back to the key cards, Honest had a discard from hand effect where your battling light monster gains attack equal to the opponent's monster's attack until the end phase, meaning your Fiend Reflection number 2 can now attack over a blue eyes white dragon. It's honestly fantastic light support. Judgment Dragon would be the boss monster of Lightsworns that includes high attack and a board wiping effect. 
It's the dad of light monsters in terms of sheer power. And finally to Geyserus, or Geyserus, how do you pronounce it? We have the second fusion for the Gladiator Beast archetype by contact fusing Bestiari and one other Gladiator Beast monster. Once it's summoned, you can destroy two cards on the field. Take that, Zaborg. If Geyserus battled, you can return it to the fusion deck to special summon two GBs from your deck aside from Bestiari. This new fusion gave GBs a fusion monster that didn't require as many materials as Heraclinos. Plus, destroying two cards upon summon was worth the effort. I haven't talked much about GBs since their debut in Gladiator's Assault, and that's because while a control variant existed, Geyserus was the glue that put everything together. Almost every beast had a tag out mechanic to special others from the deck with additional effects. Bessiari with back row removal, Darius with grave summon, Laquari got 300 extra attack, Mermillo with face up monster destruction, and Sakuto summons more from the deck. And then Test Tiger could summon itself if you controlled a beast and then use itself and another beast to summon another beast from the deck. Now, the deck had way more destructive power, making this iteration of Gladiator Beast not only controlling, but explosive at the same time. Not only Geyserus, but the hit on Dad Return decks allowed for more decks to emerge, and in March earlier this 2008 year, Duelist Pack Collection Tin Jaden Yuki saw the release of Elemental Hero Prisma, a monster that could send fusion materials from the deck to the grave and copy that fusion material's name, which worked great with Gladiator Beast and the required fusion materials. This also meant the fusion deck saw other possible fusion plays, like Sandwich, Reaper on the Nightmare, and a variety of Neos fusions. This is also why Dark Panther was cited in as often as it could be used for Prisma, Rescue Cat for Panther and Test Tiger, or as an additional Crush Card Virus target. Just having Prisma and Test Tiger turn one was a powerful play. It was no surprise why the deck became so strong all of a sudden, for it embodies almost all aspects of the field, deck, and graveyard. So yeah, Light of Destruction, while not as groundbreaking as its predecessor, was another powerhouse set and a great way to end the GX Core set series. I mean, we even got Jinzo support! Jinzo support! On June 18th, the special edition was released with Kaisa's counterpart, Curaz, the Light Monarch, that destroys two cards on the field, with the owner drawing a card for each card destroyed. This meant you had to think about what to use Curaz's effect on. Also, it cannot attack when summoned, so out of the gate, it was a less decent Geyserus. And the final release of May was the Shonen Jump subscription bonus in Exodius, the ultimate forbidden lord. This brown Exodia, unlike his brother, must be on the field to get his plethora of effects going. It must be special by sending all monsters in your grave back to the deck. When it declares an attack, you have to send one monster from your hand or deck to the grave. It also receives a thousand attack for each normal monster in your grave as well. It does include a win condition if you have the five pieces of Exodia in the grave sent by Exodius' effect. It wouldn't see any meta play until as early as 2013 Hieratix, but not for its win condition, rather for its Xyz material usage. June was quite a quiet month that we'll get to in the event section, so for now we'll head over to July. Early in the month, on the 8th, would be Retro Pack 1, a European exclusive booster pack for cards never released in EU markets, like Blue Eyes Ultimate Dragon, Ancient Lamp, Copycat, and others. At the end of the month, on the 31st, would be Premium Pack 2, the sequel set to the one in 2007 that finally gave the TCG Magician of Black Chaos. This included many cards from the GX manga and other cards that helped the premium packs appear unique from other side sets. Mizuki would be the standout card here as great zombie support since by banishing itself from the grave lets you special summon one zombie from the grave, another useful zombie recursion card. 
and those are all the new releases, so let's move on to the meta. After the emergency list, Dark Arm Dragon decks were still strong, but their return strategy was in pieces. Jason Holloway at SJ Nashville, the first SJC of Gladiator format, would win with the last hurrah of Dad Return, incorporating one return and two escape from the Dark Dimension, a card that was used in early iterations of Dad Return. But after Light of Destruction, other relevant strategies would emerge and the Dad deck would evolve into a more control variation, being dubbed Dark armed control. Dad went for the store for milk and never returned after Nashville. And other decks did emerge right away, like Top 16 Gravekeeper Monarch. The deck made sense. Necro Valley stops anything that moves itself from the grave and Monarchs infamously fill in the power vacuum of boss monsters. Plus, Caius the Shadow Monarch was now seeing more experimentation since its banishing effect didn't punish you too bad when the emergency list hit all the powerful return cards. Following that at SJ St. Louis, we would see even more variety in the top 16. Dale Bolito Light Sworn, Machine with a Spicy Jinzo Twist, Tried and True Big City, Counter Fairy making their debut. But Gladiator Beast would make its first SJC win here. Gladiator Beast would also win every single other SJC in the format. The last event at SJ Toronto would see Bolito adopting the clear top deck by incorporating Stratos to fetch Prisma and Cold Wave to stop the competition. So make sure to side in Prohibition to counter Prisma, Bessiari, and to play around Cold Wave since it remains active on the field. Anti Meta Gadget would see top 16 at the US Nationals. Then at the Canadian Nationals, we saw Yannick Debo get top 8 with Counter Fairy in a very unique build that I'd like to highlight. This is the guy who tried Cyber Dark last year in Trooper format. In this iteration, the spicy tech is Arcana Force Zero, the Fool. When the coin is flipped tails, the Fool cannot be targeted by any card. Adding in that Fool can't be destroyed by battle, you potentially have a monster that no Dad or Marmillo could take care of. Then you have Van Dalgion, the Dark Dragon Lord, the February 2008 Shonen Jump promo that was designed around counter traps and could bring the Fool back if need be. Debo took what Mikhail created at St. Louis and added a unique twist to it. Counter Fairies have the ability to control what hit the field and and that made it a very risky, yet synergetic deck that you can't help but feel annoyed by, yet respect at the same time. The next SJC would be an important one, however. At SJ Philly, there was a key ruling change. I've mentioned starting in Dad Return format that Royal Oppression started seeing more meta play. After all, it took care of the top decks and was free in the decks that ran it. A continuous trap that allows either duelist to pay 800 life points to negate a special summon? You can see where its power lies in the contemporary climate. The thing was, was that the card needed to be face up already to use its effect. But at SJ Philly, it was reruled to be legal to respond to an inherent special summon like Dad or Geysaris, which made Oppression a surprise play and ultimately a totally different card. Now special summoning just had an anti-meta hurdle to leap over. One important deck to make use of the ruling would be Adam Korn's Prime Material Monarch. This deck, which is an evolution of the Soul Control deck like what we saw in Nashville, incorporated both Royal Oppression and the recently released Prime Material Dragon. PMD was tough to take care of in both attack and defense. Geysaris couldn't attack into it without crashing, and if you had PMD in DEF, it was tough for most other monsters to attack through as well. Its effect is that you can discard a card to negate an effect that would destroy a monster, so Mermillo and Dark Armed Dragon couldn't deal with it with their effects. And its other effect, where it flips burn damage to heal instead, made the burn strategy useless when up against it. At this point, there weren't many non-destruction based cards and PMD fit that bill. Then you had plenty of crush card targets and Mask of Darkness to recur many powerful traps like Crush, Oppression, and Reckless Greed. 
After all, to survive against Gladiator Beast, one must play plenty of channelable cards. Prime Material Monarch became a tightly knit anti-meta deck that arose up the ranks quickly. Come SJ Honolulu, we would see 50 card Light Sworn and even Dark Arm Control by Chris Bowling, which opted for more draw engines like Traden and control cards like Phoenix Wing Wind Blast. At SJ Toronto, there'd be a spicy top 16 deck in Dark Creator Turbo, one of, if not the most underrated deck of the format. This strategy revolves around a plethora of draw two spells. The idea is to balloon the field from zero to five monsters just like that and explode with combos afterwards. Phantom of Chaos adds more utility to DDR and lets you copy many powerful effect monsters like Dad, Plasma, and Creator, which allowed for more special summoning. It's nice to see more dark counterpart boss monsters see more play. However, the true spice would be the non-topping decks. The duelists who didn't make it far at the events, yet tested what they believed could work in an ideal setting. Jeff Baumgartner tried this Recruiter deck inspired by Recruiter Chaos. John Moore gave Six Samurai a go. Hersan Koto Portillo matched Lightsworn with Beckoning Light, a trap that would become mass grave to hand recursion for light monsters and set up your graveyard for Judgment Dragon at the same time. Lastly, we have Mike Pianca and his Burn deck. This deck used a popular card in Europe, Destiny Hero Defender, a 4-star monster with a whopping 27k defense. Holy moly. Combine that with skill drain and other general protection, and you got yourself a new sound burn strategy. Having a format after an emergency list is likely for it to be a weird format. After all, the only shakeups to the meta was the fractioning of Dad Return, the release of Light of Destruction, and the reruling of Royal Oppression. Between Stein Monarch format and Trooper format had that degenerate Airblade Turbo period. Even Warrior format was sandwiched between the explosive chaos format and the respected goat format. And that's what gladiator format kind of is. A time in Yu-Gi-Oh that unfortunately existed in between two important parts of the game's timeline, despite its own healthy meta game state. In many ways, gladiator took a step back from the absurdity of dad return to a more perfect circle-like time, even if GBs dominated the event scene like how dad return did. With all that said, Said, tier 2 and rogue decks still made their way consistently in top 16s. Light Sworn, Dark Arm Control with Return Variant, Prime Material Monarch with Soul Control Variant, Counter Fairy, Anti Meta Gadget, Big City, Machine, and Dark Raider Turbo. The tier 1 deck was evident, but that certainly did not stop duelists from having fun with the dual environment. You could see new strategies and card theory emerge around every corner as the format progressed from the remnants of Dad Return to the dominance of Gladiator Beast, which, given the whole history of the game, still had time to grow as a deck. July 2008 would mark the end of GX era Yu-Gi-Oh, and it really did make an impact to the direction of the game in only three years. Once it shook off the presence of Chaos and Go Control decks, Monarchs took over as both main boss monsters and as important support cards. Come 2007, an abundance of fast decks and OTKs emerged, which was mostly halted by ban lists and a new class of boss monsters like Light and Darkness Dragon, Destiny Hero Plasma, and Dark Arm Dragon come 2008. The game saw a change from good stuff toolboxes to heavier engine based decks of archetypes and bosses. While it wasn't quite to what we may expect nowadays in terms of sheer volume, the shift in direction was noticeable when comparing 2005 Go Control to 2008 Light Sworn. By the end, what made the Yu Gi Oh! GX anime protagonist Jaden's deck so unique became the top tier deck. No, not heroes, although Destiny heroes did make make their mark and elementals showed up in Big City, rather Gladiator Beast and Contact Fusion. Duelists got their game on, and from here, Yu-Gi-Oh would finally enter the future.